I would like to begin my remarks today by thanking UNMIS Special Representative of the Secretary General, Mr. Nicholas Hasem, the mission, the United Nations country team, and in particular the senior women's protection advisor and her team for their strategic efforts to tackle conflict-related sexual violence, which continues to be one of the most traumatic features of the conflict in South Sudan. I speak to you at a moment of great global turbulence, characterized by multiple cascading crises, including an epidemic of coup and military takeovers from Afghanistan to Sudan, Guinea, Mali, Myanmar, and elsewhere, which have turned back the clock on women's rights. Women, men, and children continue to be at risk of conflict-related sexual violence while facing pandemic-related restrictions, spiking violence, and reduced access to services and legal protection. Commitments on paper remain largely unmet in practice. Sexual violence continues to be perpetrated by parties to the conflict, with a steady increase in the number of incidents of conflict-related sexual violence perpetrated by community-based militia against the backdrop of increasing social and economic uncertainty and unrest. The recent record numbers of sexual violence, which has doubled compared with the same period last year, and the reports that emerged from Lear County in April are extremely concerning. Despite these challenges, modest progress has been made in terms of implementing the action plan for the armed forces on addressing conflict-related sexual violence, despite human and financial resource constraints. The Senior Women's Protection Advisor and her team have been able to keep the implementation of the Joint Communique on Prevention and Response to Sexual Violence on track, despite these challenges. Training initiatives for the armed forces focused on the prevention and response to sexual violence, as well as command responsibility, have continued. To ensure that all military personnel are made aware of their obligations, the action plan has been translated and widely disseminated. A joint implementation committee on conflict-related sexual violence comprising of 11 senior officials of the South Sudan People's Defense Forces, the Sudan People's Liberation Army in opposition, and the South Sudan Opposition Alliance, mandated by the Joint Defense Board to oversee implementation of the Joint Action Plan and to produce progress reports, was formally launched in November 2021. Since then, I have received their first progress report detailing the actions that are being taken to curtail sexual violence by the armed forces. The Minister of Defense and Veteran Affairs launched a training manual for instructors on conflict-related sexual violence, which was prepared with technical support from the Office of the Senior Women's Protection Advisor. Furthermore, the mission provided advisory and logistical support to justice actors to ensure steps are being taken on accountability for sexual violence crimes and to promote access to justice. I am encouraged by these measures and call on all actors, including the South Sudan National Police Service, to continue to meaningfully implement their respective action plans and commitments in line with the survivor-centered approach articulated in Security Council Resolution 2467 of 2019. Impunity for crimes of conflict-related sexual violence remains pervasive, with limited progress made in relation to the thousands of cases reported over the past decade. Positive developments, such as last year's prosecution and conviction by civilian courts in Warap and Western Bar el Ghazal states are steps in the right direction, but they are far from equal to the scale and magnitude of the challenge. The conditions of, of protracted armed conflict have exacerbated pre existing gender based discrimination and harmful patriarchal social norms. To ensure we address the root causes of sexual violence, we must redouble our focus on prevention. 
Instead of simply reacting to these crimes, we must empower those at risk and build their resilience to social and economic shocks. In this connection, I'm pleased to announce that on the occasion of the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, I am launching a new framework on the prevention of conflict-related sexual violence. This framework will translate the concept of compliance with international norms into practical reality in order to support governments to implement prevention programs in a survivor-centered manner. It is intended to serve as a roadmap to assist all relevant actors and stakeholders, especially governments and the UN system, to improve and expand programmatic efforts to better prevent this scourge. Empowering survivors requires investing in broad-based social protection and employment opportunities, including to enhance economic and food security, as we know that poverty is one of the drivers of sexual and gender-based violence. We have seen time and time again how food security and physical security are intrinsically linked. Sexual violence crimes are perpetrated against women in South Sudan while they are engaged in essential livelihood activities to support the food security of their family by collecting food or gathering firewood to use as cooking fuel. Ensuring food security can play a vital role in protecting women and girls from exposure to violence. Research on the long-term effects of conflict-related sexual violence on the health and social well-being of survivors is scant, but crucial to informing policy and improving programs tailored to conflict-affected communities. I believe there should be more in-depth research on economic programming to tackle this gap. Members of the monitoring analysis and reporting arrangements on conflict-related sexual violence drawn from several UN agencies, can play an important role when it comes to connecting their programming with research on economic interventions to reduce sexual violence in South Sudan. In this connection, I welcome the project currently being implemented in the greater Equatoria region, which aims to empower 195 women and girls who were abducted by armed groups. The project is expected to empower survivors to recover from the experience of sexual violence in captivity and to contribute to their socioeconomic reintegration in the context of a supportive and stigma-free environment while enhancing their economic independence through livelihood projects. Women survivors continue to face multifaceted health and social problems in the post-conflict period. Understanding the persistent health and social challenges they face is critical for developing effective and targeted interventions. Increasing access to care, particularly services tailored to treating chronic reproductive health issues and psychological trauma is of paramount importance to helping victims of sexual violence in South Sudan to move forward as survivors. Local women's rights organizations working tirelessly to ensure that services reach survivors must also be protected. Being on the front lines, local organizations see the early warning signs of sexual violence and other atrocity crimes first, and are often the last to be heard and heeded by security stakeholders and the international community. Creating a conducive operating environment and safe civic space is a crucial part of prevention. To conclude, I would emphasize that all tools must work in tandem to reverse the emboldening effects of impunity, that prevention must be paramount, and that we must reinforce at every opportunity the message that the only shame of rape is in committing, commanding, or condoning it. The rights, needs, aspirations, and well-being of survivors must be at the heart of all of our interventions as we strive to prevent the occurrence and recurrence of these grave crimes. Thank you.